it begins to start out just altering your mood. It's a, you get an email, you get a text, you get a phone call, uh, you meet somebody in the coffee shop at, uh, at the workplace or something like that. And it begins to take on um, an emotional tone to it. You begin to anticipate it, look forward to it. And then you begin to actually try to grow it and develop it. And then it becomes kind of a third stage thing where you actually uh, know you can go back to it and you'll get the charge you're looking for, like a great strong cup of coffee or something like that. Welcome to the Focus on the Family broadcast, helping families thrive. John, I'm really pleased to have Dave back with us again. I know this is a tough subject, and I know there's some people in the audience that are going to say, hey, my spouse and I, we have a great relationship. This is uncomfortable. I get that. But there are a lot of people in the Christian community and certainly outside the Christian community that struggle with attraction after you're married. And uh, we want to make sure that we're equipping you with the ability to recognize the pattern, to recognize the danger of it before it costs you your marriage Mm -hmm. and your family. Mm -hmm. The destruction that we see here at Focus from those bad choices in the heat of the moment uh, would break your heart. And you hear about the impact on these children. Adults, you know, we often rationalize it. It, it, You know, it's just the way God made me, what have you. But the impact on your kids, you have got to back up and think about the lifelong generational impact that you may cause. And that sounds heavy, and it is heavy. Mm. I'm not going to walk around it. Dave, it's great to have you back. Thanks Uh, thanks for the education last time, and it was really helpful. You went through the different um, areas that people can be entrapped. In fact, I think it'd be good for those that didn't catch it. Uh, Let's just recap that a bit. Give us those various types of affairs that we covered briefly, and then we'll get moving. Well, class one is that one night stand. Uh, you didn't know the individual. You're maybe away at a conference or something. It's private. Alcohol is almost always involved. A lot of remorse and regret afterwards. Real common story <clears throat> about that. Second is the entangled affair where it's a friendship that develops gradually over time. It eventually turns sexual. You feel like you found your uh, soulmate, somebody that understands you. You're willing to trash everything in your life to maintain this relationship. And it's important. You related that to Samson and Delilah. Yeah, I yeah. think that's great. Yeah. Uh, and the, Samson and Delilah, they, they, this is an illustration. Since they, he could not stay away from that woman, even though he knew she was trying to kill him. I mean, I mean it's absurd. It's it insanity. Is. And when you begin to think of it like that, you, you say, yes, that is crazy. But people who watch these kind of things happen, they think their spouse has developed a mental illness. I've heard that a lot of times. Like, hmm. who is this person? And that's entangled <laughs> affair. Now move to the next. Okay, sexual addiction, which is a com- sexual compulsivity. It- it's not a relationship issue at all. It just is trying to satisfy or self-medicate some anger, hurt, pain in your life. It's repeated sexual offenses. Eli and his sons were an illustration of that. They did that. God took their lives, took Eli's life prematurely because he would not stop this process in Israel. And it has all kinds of repercussions today because of smartphones, ability to attach this to pornography, massage parlors, strip clubs, prostitutes. It just all gets all mixed up. Dave, in that context, um, that's one we hear a lot about. Yeah. Um, And and particularly, it doesn't always go this way, but particularly men who are trapped there. Yeah. And when their wives find out or if their husbands have the courage to begin to talk about it... um, there can be a variety of reactions. The most common reaction is this break of trust Mm -hmm. that the spouse feels, and it's over. Yeah, I can't stand this. But the way you just described that, this self-medicating, that's really what's going on deeper. Oh, it is. It is. And it's good, I think, for a spouse to try to dig a little deeper and understand more what's at stake here. Yeah. This is not a marital issue. This couple often goes into their pastor or to a therapist because they want to work on the marriage. This is not a marital issue. This person would have done this no matter who they married. Okay? And they actually married this person hoping it would fix this pain in their life, and it didn't. A sex addict gets two years of marriage before he begins to act out again or before she begins to act out again because huh. it's insufficient. It doesn't really deal with the issue. So in this case, before you do couples counseling, the individual who's been acting out has to get sober. He needs some, in, or she needs some individual help first. 
That's a sexual addiction one. Yeah, and yeah. then lastly is that reconnection. Yeah, we get that, um, or or the add-on affair. Where add-on affair. A, yeah, where it, the marriage is great. You're not planning on leaving it. You're both dedicated to it, uh, your marriages. But you have this one little activity or behavior or whatever it is that you share together. And it's very legitimate m- many times. But it's during that connection, you build this emotional friendship that's way too uh, compulsive and and it actually does turn into a sexual affair many times. Not always, but many times it does. Then the last on, last one is that emotional attachment, that you be, uh, that reconnection where you go back to an old girlfriend or boyfriend and you find them. And it's like 30 days and you're crazy in love with them again. And that's the internet problem. That's you the know, internet problem. Yeah. With people from your old high school class. Uh, you or... never forget stuff from adolescence. We talked about cars last time and everything else. You just never forget those old girlfriends. Hey, Dave, adolescence. those are all the outside factors, but we have internal factors too that you point out in the book. Uh, What role does our family of origin play in these risks of infidelity? As Christians, we often think once we become a Christian, all the past is cut off. It's amputated. It's, It's under the blood. It's done away with. But that's just not true. You bring those influences with you into this adulthood life. So just think about it. The guy that grows up in a single-parent family, uh, mom's busy trying to put food on the table. She doesn't have a lot of time to sit down and watch TV with you. She might not be able to go to games that you participate in or anything else because she, she's just trying to make it, okay? Or maybe you are a young girl in that family and your dad abandons you. What do you think of men as a result of that kind of an experience? Sure. So you bring these wounds with you from the family of origin. and there, No family is perfect. We often try. I know. I try too. But you, you do bring these wounds from your family into this marital relationship. It might be a commitment. It might be a promise. I'll never put my kids through what I went through type of thing. But you... You bring them, nevertheless. To the How table. are those practically attached then to sexual issues? Um, you know, well, I, I want to. I know that family of origin well. I'm from a single parent. Okay. I had just about every family type you could live in okay. as an yeah. orphan kid and the whole yeah. bit. But, yeah. but as a Christian, when you're you make when you make that commitment to the Lord. How do you begin to sort those things out? Confront your past, yeah. acknowledge those weaknesses. That's right. And then say, okay. Yeah. I'm going to try or I'm not going to do this, this, or that. Yeah. Describe that to give me a practical okay. tool. Give me the tool chest. Okay. Well, all first-time adulteries are about two things, comfort and distraction. Huh. Always. Always. We always, that's what we fish for in the first session. Where's the comfort? What, what was the need for comfort? Comfort from what? Okay. And what are you trying to turn away from? What are you trying to get out of? What are you trying to leave behind? What kind of an artificial world are you trying to create that you didn't have without this person? It's all about comfort and distraction. So you bring this emptiness, and in the marriage, you begin to realize, I got a great marriage. I've been married 51 years. But my wife and I, we cannot satisfy every single need each of us have. It's just impossible. So you have to be aware of the deficits. But I'll tell you, the big ones are all about admiration and affirmation and affection. Those three big A's. Huh. And marriages that <clears throat> don't supply some of those needs, we all need more affirmation than we can probably receive. We all need someone to admire us and look up to us. And if those begin to decline, you become vulnerable to somebody who will pay attention to you. You know, Dave, that is really profound, number one. I'm thinking it, it, it opens my mind up to the wounded spouse. Yeah. Um, and again, here at Focus, we hear from a lot of people, but it's let's just put it in this context. And again, for everybody, uh, it can be gender flip, so don't hear it always <laughs> goes this way. Um, you don't need to let us know about that because I, I, it's a, the spirit in which I give this. But the wife that was sexually wounded as a teenage girl, maybe something terrible happened to mm. her, but she wants to pick up those pieces, and she may or may not have talked about it with her in her courtship with her now husband. But there's a distance there. There's a physical inability to allow herself to be intimate. And the husband knows that, but he can't figure out what's going yeah, on. Yeah. Um, but it's never talked about. It's never revealed. So he just interprets that as she's cold. Uh-huh. You know, yeah. And he, she doesn't want <clears throat> to enjoy this aspect of God's yeah. design for marriage. Yeah. That can lead to an affair, too, because oh. then the man is out 
looking for that satisfaction doesn't justify it. Mm-hmm. But I'm just saying these are kind of the fractures that occur in a relationship for all kinds of reasons. Oh. But describe a little more detail and how, how to approach that with the uh, story I just gave well, you. Well, let me just take that and go right with it because when this young married couple starts having children, this wife, 50% of all the first-time affairs in America occur in pregnancy or the first year after delivery. Wow. Okay. Now, the reason for that is this. When that wife has this little baby and she's nursing that little baby or feeding that baby, holding that baby, the oxytocin just goes crazy. She just feels like she's in love with the world. Everything is right. Now, you know when guys have the highest levels of oxytocin? When they have sexual intercourse with someone who wants to be sexual with them. It has to be that combination. It has to be the combination. Interesting. Masturbation, prostitution, none of that measures up like that. Huh. So here's a little neglected hubby out there sometimes. Hmm. The wife is sleep deprived. She's consumed with the kids. She's up late at night. She might have some uh, nausea when she's pregnant. She, you know, you don't feel like making love when you're, you're sick to your stomach. Right. <laughs> so all of that's kind of changing, and it's a big adjustment for guys, but nobody talks about it in premarital counseling. Nobody. No. no. And and I need to make sure people are hearing that's not an excuse to have an affair. No, it's I not. I mean, that, no. do not take that as no. a legitimate reason. Just recognize you're at a high risk during in, that time. It's mm-hmm. what you call in your book, Seasons of Life. It I is. I think that fits into that yeah. category. You've got to, as a spouse, whether you're the husband or the wife, whatever's happening, you've got to be able to do the right thing in God's view, and yeah. that is to love your spouse unconditionally. Yeah, yeah. And to get through that period of time, talk about it. Yeah. You know, the fact that you miss that intimacy, but um, that's probably the best thing you can do is, is mm. um, talk that through and make time, make time, okay. even though you're struggling, but maybe husbands, you need to pitch in yeah. and do some of that load so your wife is a little more rested. There you go. And can, and can yeah. help meet some of the needs that you have in that regard. Yeah. I mean, this is all dicey business, though, oh, isn't it? Oh, it is. And there's no formula that works for everybody. Mm-hmm. But you do have to find your own, and you have to really make sure you work your way through this process. And, and know, see it as normal. It's not bad. Yeah. Dave, you talk also about different marriage styles that have higher incidence of close calls, uh, you know, those that lean into an emotional affair and then it may be a physical affair if it goes that far. Uh, what are those characteristics of the weak marriages? And I, I mean that as a profile, mm. almost a personality profile of the marriage. Mm. Describe that for the listeners. Well, I'm going to go backwards. So let's take the empty nest one. This is a couple who are married who have focused on their kids. They do everything as a family. They don't spend any money on the marriage. So it's a child-centric home. Yeah, exactly. And they come into this marriage out of a broken family situations. And they often have promised themselves they're going to do it differently. And everything is spent on. And so they, the kids leave home. They sit down at the breakfast table. They look across the table and they say, who in the heck are you? Okay. They don't even know each other. Okay. 25 years have passed three or four kids, great parents, but no marriage. Okay? Yeah. And uh, they are very, very vulnerable. And that's why we see this huge rise in mm-hmm. parents divorcing when kids go off to college. They call it the graying yeah. of divorce. Yeah, it is. Yep. Empty nesters. Yeah. And then we have the intimacy avoidant marriage. That the marriage that doesn't stay very close. We call it the windshield wiper syndrome. You know, they just move the same distance back and forth across the glass, very effective, etc. But they don't move towards each other. They can't for all kinds of reasons. So intimacy avoidant, you don't talk about anything personal, it's all external, etc. Then we have the conflict avoidant marriage. And this a marriage is very appealing to Christians. They feel like this is the highest form of marriage. No conflict. Oh. It doesn't work that way. You've got different genes, different family of origins, different life experiences. Of course there's differences. And there should be there mild, should be. at least yeah. mild conflict yeah. on some things. Exactly. I mean, some people will say we've never argued, Dave. I mean, oh. we have never had a conflict in our 40-year marriage. We call that dial tone. Mm. Okay. <laughs> That's another one. Yeah, yeah. Dial tone. Describe yeah. that. Yeah, well, that is the conflict avoidant marriage where it's just no ups and downs, no differences tolerated. We all do everything together. We Everybody all look knows alike. the dance steps. Everybody knows the dance, yeah. And yeah. you just do it. You do it. Can people be happy that way? Or you're saying they're vulnerable. Well, they are vulnerable. To, and this is a great illustration, I think. Somebody told me this one time. It's like the dark side of the moon. Nobody's ever been to the dark side of the moon. But when you are in that kind of a marriage, there is another side of you that your spouse has never touched. And that person will touch that side. 
And it's like you suddenly awaken. You feel like, oh, my gosh, this person understands me. I never knew. I This is a soulmate. <laughs> right. It's not true. That's when you go to the art class that's, together or that's the hiking right. class yeah. or whatever it might yeah. be. And that's a danger spot you need to be aware of. Yeah. Dave, we have really hit uh, three quarters of the two-day broadcast. We have, I hope, illuminated the trap. Yeah. I want to turn now. Let's talk about some solutions. And one of them is uh, seeking forgiveness mm -hmm. and why that is key. And mm -hmm. how does that play out in your mm -hmm. experience counseling these couples? Yeah. Well, forgiveness is the core of it. Even uh, all the secular people who work in this field, that my colleagues and such, we all agree that forgiveness is a key. And everybody has some idea of forgiveness. Even Disney has an idea of forgiveness. Let it go, you know. So <laughs> uh, you have to do that. But the thing, when most couples get stuck in recovery and they aren't able to really restore the marriage, it's one of two things, always, almost always. One, it's an incomplete forgiveness process. Or two, they don't have enough good history to fall back on to save a marriage. In other words, it's a bad marriage from the beginning and this just compounds the badness. Huh. But let's talk about forgiveness. None of us are perfect spouses, and we've all injured the marriage over time. And that's the first level of forgiveness you have to work through, uh, what you've contributed to the deterioration of the marriage over time, apart from the sexual issues. And both spouses need to go through that. Both do. Then the second part of the forgiveness process has to do with the actual betrayal. Okay. You, you know, Dave, seriously, talk to that man particularly. And again, it could the shoe could be on the other foot. I get that. But speak to that person who is only half-heartedly putting forgiveness forward. Okay. That's a great lead. I love that. Your spouse that you betrayed has the right to know anything and everything they want to know about your betrayal. If you want respect and you want their respect and you want their trust, then they got to feel like you don't hold any secrets. Dave, let me let me tease this out a little yeah. bit because in the word, you know, the Lord says he hates divorce. Yeah. Then he gives a way out. Uh -huh. And this is the one way. Uh -huh. um, I would think safety rationally is also if you have abuse occurring, physical oh, yeah. abuse, uh, abandonment. It can be debated, yeah. but those are uh, also in that yeah. in that uh, in that arena. Yeah. However, God is very specific in yeah. His Scripture in His Word that when it comes to adultery and betrayal and infidelity, this is the reason that you can divorce. Talk about God's heart in that regard. Go a little deeper that way. Forget the the practicality for a minute. Just talk about what God is experiencing when he sees his children doing this. Oh, marriage is an illustration of God, the Father, and Israel, Jesus, and the church. I mean, it, it's the... It's the metaphor. It is. It is. And it never is a lot of hard work. It's always presented in a joyous uh, attachment, uh, fellowship, connection. It's not like you're grinding it out every day, you know, type of thing. And there are some marriages who do that, that, that practice that kind of stuff. I don't think God's really pleased with those either, but I do think people can change those kind of behaviors. But the one thing the betrayed spouse, Jim, has to get, the betrayed spouse has to feel like her husband or his wife gets what they did to me. Yeah. That's why we do the extended forgiveness letter. That's so that's where, where prove that it. healing starts. That's when where that it comes from. When that betrayed spouse yeah. feels they're understood. You get it. Yeah. That yeah. they're not just gaming yeah. me. Yeah, that's right. They're yeah. not playing yeah. me. Yeah, that's right. Because I've been played so far. That's right. I, got, I get that. I can yeah. understand that yeah. sense of betrayal. Yeah. Uh, Dave, you mentioned the history, that if a marriage has been troubled from the beginning that has no history to build or rebuild, if there's been a, a break of trust. Let's assume, and I would want you to describe a healthier history that something negative has happened, that betrayal, that breaking of trust. What can couples do to look back on the history and begin to build? You mentioned that in the book, kind of going back to your history together to find the good things, yeah. the good boulders that yeah. can lay a new foundation yeah. for your relationship. Yeah. Describe those boulders. What do they look like? Well. Uh, it might be a little surprising to you, but there's great research out there to indicate that if 20%, you don't need a whole lot of great history, but if just 20% of your marital history is ranked highly by both of you, simultaneous in the same time zone, and contiguous, not broken by bad periods, 
you have better than a 92% chance of saving your marriage after adultery and sexual betrayal. Wow, that's incredible. 92%. So you can go back to those good times. Good Describe times. Describe how you do that in your counseling. How uh, do you get them to remember those? Uh, because they're in the fit oh, of yeah. rage right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I remember when we used to laugh a yeah. lot. So yeah. what? I'm not laughing now. Yeah, yeah exactly. Right? You got it. Okay, so what? one of the exercises we do in the reattachment process, after the forgiveness letter, of course, is uh, to each of you make a list of your eight best experiences. They can happen while you're dating, but it cannot include other couples. It cannot include children. It cannot include your wedding day. So best experiences together. Together, just the two of you, okay? She builds a list, he builds a list. Most couples that really are inclined to save their marriage, they will have somewhere between three and five that match. So let's say they have four. She gets five, he gets six, she gets seven, he gets eight. Those are your eight greatest experiences. Those are what sealed you together. Those are what compelled you to stay together. And you need to go back and repeat those. I tell my couples, when you leave me in the first 18 months after you say goodbye to me, I want you to practice every one of those because those are what you did best and you got in trouble by stopping what you do best. You Mm. quit doing what you do best. You know, Dave, uh, the crazy thing when you see this over and over again, and you have described this in such great detail and the patterns of human behavior, um, it's got to be frustrating that we step in the same puddle all the time. You've got to go, wow, why does this happen, Lord? Why do us as human beings, why are we so, if I could say it, why are we so stupid? Because predictability is always a higher value than pain-free living. Huh. So if you can predict what's going to happen, even if it's hurtful, you'll do it. Rather than the healthier thing. That's right, because you don't really think about the outcome of that one. Uh, What are some of the other ways we can protect our marriages? We've hit a few, but give me a rapid fire. I'm going to give you a great one. So get yourself a little notebook with a wire spiral across the top. She gets one, he gets one. And every day, the research is based on 30 straight days. Each day, every day for 30 straight days, you can't work ahead. You, You wake up in the morning and you look for something you like about your spouse. And then you write two or three sentences in your little book why you like it. And that night before you go to bed, while you're laying in bed looking up at the ceiling, each of you thank God for that quality in your spouse. It can be simple. Some, maybe he takes a shower today. That's really <laughs> nice. Okay? Start basics. <laughs> yeah, basics. You know? Low one, bar there. <laughs> one of the things I did when the first time my wife and I did this, my wife has a great smile. And I said, I like seeing your smile when I first come home at night. I like seeing you smile at me when our eyes meet across the crowd of room. And I like seeing you smile at me after we've had a big disagreement. So I prayed that prayer. Dear God, thank you for giving my wife such a great smile. Out loud? Out loud. So she can hear. She can hear it. And yeah. you don't tell each other until at night. So every for 30 days, you know your spouse is looking, watching, figuring out what they like about you. I love that. Yeah, that right great. there is a good good place that's to stop, take away. Yeah. And uh, Dave, this has been so wonderful, so insightful, really. And I, I hope everyone has benefited. I, I can't imagine that if you have thought about these things or maybe – you're in that uh, stage of either emotional attachment or any of the things that Dave has described these last couple of days, this is the greatest help for you right now. This is the safety line coming out to you to say, don't jump in that that pool or that ocean of affairs. Uh, don't do it. Stay on the ship of your marriage where you can weather these things. And Dave, again, so good and so insightful. Thank you so much for that. Hey, Dave, uh, given the cultural stuff that's going on, uh, we're going to say goodbye right now. But let's carry this conversation online and folks can come and listen in. uh, Because I want to talk very directly about what's happening in the culture, those areas of power Mm -hmm. like the media, Hollywood, politicians that are falling left and right over the last few months. Let's have a little more discussion about what's going on there. Can we do it? I'd love to. All right. Hey, I'm John Fuller, and thanks for watching. Get more info about Focus over here and more from our guests over there, and be sure to subscribe to our channel as well.